Coral reefs are the most biologically diverse marine habitats in the world. Millions of people rely on them for food, as well as the reefs themselves affording vital protection against storm damage and coastal erosion. But years of unsustainable fishing practices and pollution and sea temperature rise means that up to a fifth of all coral reefs around the world have already been destroyed. I'm Russell Beard in Oahu, Hawaii, to meet a marine biologist who's working on a super cool solution to coral reef conservation. This is Coconut Island. Formerly a private party island for entertaining presidents and movie stars, it's since been colonized by a community of marine biologists. How are you? We're really excited about it. This could be a great day. And thanks to Dr. Mary Hagadon at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, it's now the world's center for cryogenic coral preservation. I, think I just saw a shark. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah, hammerhead. <laughs> hammerhead sharks. Oh, man. One of my major concerns about coral reefs is that we're having both warming and, and, and slow acidification of the ocean caused by overuse of fossil fuels. If we can take their sperm and ultimately their eggs and embryos, then we can form a frozen repository that will help us potentially reseed areas that are, are shrinking or ultimately keep it for hundreds of years and reseed the ocean. Get on the map for a second. Hi guys. What? How are you doing? Today we're headed out to Turtle Rock to collect samples from the reef and learn more about these often misunderstood marine creatures. Coral, number one, are animals and they reproduce. Coral spawn once a year, generally, wow. and so they synchronize their spawning based on the moon and the sun. Uh, tomorrow and the next day will be this period that this coral spawn. We're in very wavy, sort of um, fast-moving water, and um, that's perfect for the coral that we're going to collect today. It's called um, Pacillopora meandrina. It's pink, and it's called commonly called the cauliflower coral because it looks just like a cauliflower. And you know those sharks that we saw back <laughs> at your? Um, is there a protocol for that kind of thing? Like you did? Do what? Are there sharks here? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mary and the team uh, just getting in the water just now. We're going to go and join them, get these samples, and get back to the lab. Known as rainforests of the sea, coral are commonly thought of as plants, but are in fact marine invertebrates that live in compact colonies and fix CO2 to create these characteristic skeletons. These cauliflower coral fragments will be housed temporarily at the lab and will be carefully reconnected to the reef in the coming months. Genetic diversity in a healthy reef allows species to adapt to changing environments, but the oceans are changing too quickly for corals to keep up. And in the last 30 years, half of the Australian Great Barrier Reef has been lost. I think so far in the future, you know, like 40 years from now, we may have nothing in the ocean. You know, it, it, you can't get to the point where everyone says, oh, you need to go out and cry and preserve these guys, because we only have two left. Yeah. You have to be yeah. working years ahead of the, the, the game. And so that's what, what we're doing here. If successful, Mary's gene bank will be a kind of frozen Noah's Ark that could theoretically be used tens, hundreds, or even thousands of years in the future. So all of our coral samples have been put to bed, ready for tomorrow morning when, fingers crossed, they'll be spawning. And I've come up to a different part of the university to meet a research professor called Ruth Gates. Now, she's looking at coral conservation from a completely different angle. Ruth heads up several research teams, one of which has been furthering our understanding of coral with the help of state-of-the-art time-lapse photography. I mean, I had been a oh, coral reef biologist for 25 years before I saw these images for the first time, and, and frankly, I had no idea it was going to look like this. Here we have the laser scanning confocal microscope. So basically, it creates high-resolution fluorescent images. You see corals in the ocean, and they look like a rock. Right. And then you bring them on here, and there's so much color and vibrancy and mm. life. And that was one of the most shocking things I saw initially, seeing how they are an animal and they're alive. These alien-looking creatures are, in fact, the mouths of the coral polyps. 
The individual red dots are photosynthetic algae that live in the coral and pay for their keep in the form of sugars that the coral need to grow. This symbiotic relationship is a fragile one. With sea temperature rise, the coral evict their algae, causing them to turn white and slowly die of starvation. This is known as bleaching. In 1998, a global bleaching event killed 16% of the world's coral reefs, and there are predictions that this year, another global bleaching event is on the way. Corals are dying at a rate that is exceeding their ability to adapt. And that is a fact. They are the canary in the coal mine for climate change. But actually, when we go out on a reef, we realize there are individual corals mm. that are seemingly able to withstand conditions that kill their neighbors. Mm. And if we can understand the mechanisms that underpin su survival, we're taking it one step further and asking whether we could harness that knowledge mm. to actually breed corals that are now preconditioned to future ocean conditions. So these are real corals in here, but these tanks we can control for temperature and for pH. This is essentially like a coral gym. That's a coral gym, exactly. Yeah, it's they're a working out right now. Well, they're, they're working out, we've got the temperature slightly higher than they would normally see in nature, and the, the chemistry is slightly depressed, that is, it's slightly more acidic, which is really recreating conditions that are predicted for 2050. So the thing that, that, that we're trying to do is really to assist evolution. It's early stages, but Ruth's aim is to breed coral that shows signs of resilience and may one day lead to a new generation of hardy offspring, which could form the basis of super resilient reefs of the future. Pretty early, the sun has just risen, and we've come down to meet Mary and the team. We're going to be working on those coral samples we picked up from the sea floor yesterday. And we're hoping that within the next hour or so, those corals are going to spawn. We'll be able to collect that genetic information and send it up to the lab to be frozen. He looks amazing, doesn't he? Yeah. I say he, but it's not. They're not really a he or a she, they're are they? He and she's, they're right? he's and she's. They're hermaphrodites. They're hermaphrodites. Wow. Very exciting. Can I add him to the pack? And uh, then it's just a bit of a waiting game. If it doesn't happen today, the team might have to wait another year for the next chance. I'm hoping that we, we will get something, because um, I, you know, that this would then that now be five years that we're waiting for this girl. The cauliflower coral is particularly important. It's native to the region and, as a pioneer species, in the event of a collapse, it's the most likely to succeed in establishing a new reef. Any luck so far? No, no spawning. Uh-oh. <sighs> Come on, guys. And then, just before we gave up... I think this one's spawning, Jenny. It looks pretty dense, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's all kicking off now. How many have spawned? I think there's like at least five or six spawning all at the same time. So I think it's kind of all hands to the pump. We have just minutes to collect the sperm before the eggs arrive. Okay, let's put it in there. It looks like a pinch of cinnamon. It, it's water. exactly right. They're so tiny. After carefully cleaning the eggs to avoid cell fertilization, the samples are rushed up to the lab for freezing. This technique, known as vitrification, has been used in human fertility treatments since the mid-1980s, but Mary and her colleagues were the first on the planet to use it for coral. And if the kit looks a bit homemade, that's because it is. When it comes to best practice for cryogenic coral preservation, these pioneers are literally writing the book. But minus 25 degrees, just about. So we have to get it down to minus 80. At minus 80, the vials can be fully submerged in the liquid nitrogen, taking them down to a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius, where chemical activity within the cell is effectively stopped, theoretically preserving the integrity of the cells indefinitely. But freezing the samples is only half the battle. So right now we're going to pull one of our samples out. 
We're gonna thaw it, just like it would happen in the future. If they can bring the sperm back to life, it will be proof that the team have successfully nailed the process for this species, and the rest of the samples can be banked for the future. So this is what I was wanting to see. That's a lot of movement. Let's see. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 40 years from now, they may be using these banks in a, in a way we never imagined. By freezing these cells, the whole DNA is there. So it's the most important book of life that we can be doing. And right now we have about 11, 12 now, hopefully, species of coral that we've cryopreserved in the world. And trillions of cells that are frozen at this point. These samples, together with the processes that they're proving possible, will provide the fertile foundations for a growing global network of biologists to join the fight and preserve our planet's marine biodiversity. Being here has made it clear that climate change isn't something to prepare for in the future. It's something that's happening right now. <laughs>